Um, I'm happy to introduce the keynote, Josh Corman. He's currently the CSO for PTC. Uh, he has previously served as the director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative for the Atlantic Council, CTO for Sonatype, director of security intelligence for Akamai, and he's been in a senior research and strategy role for 451 Group as well as IBM and the ISS team. He's co-founded the Rugged Software and a whole bunch of other projects uh, to encourage new uh, views and looking at different security approaches as sort of the world is uh, uh, sort of more dependent on digital infrastructure. He also serves as an adjunct facility for Carnegie Mellon Heinz College, and he was uh, asked to be on the Congressional Task Force for the Healthcare Industry for Cybersecurity. Uh, I've known Josh a long time. He and I have collaborated on several things. We've even spoke together on software liability and things like that. I'm, I'm really pleased that he's here. Um, if you've not met Josh, he's a great guy, right? And he's got a ton of great ideas. Um, and he really, in my opinion, has the ability to rally people around getting things done and, and trying to fix issues. Um, I've seen him personally start and bring a lot of people together with a lot of initiatives. There's this one called I Am The Calvary that makes my eye twitch every time we talk about it. Um, but while maybe myself and some others were initially skeptical of it, right, maybe it was the name, maybe it was something else, um, I can tell you that what he's been able to do is organize a bunch of people in the security industry to have a voice outside of the industry, into the government, into healthcare, and all those sorts of things. Um, so with that, does, does anyone now have kids where like you have like foul language at home and you have a swear jar where you're like, you, get, you find yourself, maybe, some of you? Last night at the speaker dinner over a few beverages, what I told uh, Josh was that I would mention the Calvary, but he was not allowed to say it once during this whole talk, and if he did, I was going to fine him $100 per time he says it, and we'll donate it to a local charity. So let's see how he does. Thrilled to have you here. If you can please help me welcome Josh to the stage. All right. Can you hear me? All right, I'm gonna keep the lab off. All right, so I'm gonna try a few new things um, and mix in some other uh, content. So this, bear with me on this first one. I'm gonna play us this little song. Anybody know the song, Who Killed Davey Moore? Anybody? Bob Dylan? Well, you will in a moment. All right, hopefully the audio is good. My question for you is, by the time you're done this very short song, who killed Davey Moore, the boxer? This is an actual boxer. Can you guys hear? I don't hear anything. Audio? Switchboard? So this, uh, Bob Dylan is actually a huge boxing fan. So there was a boxer who wasn't feeling too well, got hit, hit his, his neck on the, on the rope, and died. So the question becomes, who killed him? Okay. Louder, please. Who killed Davey Moore? Why? What's the reason for not I, said the referee. Don't point your finger at me. I could have stopped it in the eight and kept him from his tragic fate. But the crowd would have booed, I'm sure, if not getting their money's worth. It's too bad he had to go, but there was pressure on me, too, you know. It wasn't me that made him fall. You can't blame me at all. Who killed Davy Moore? What's the reason for? Not us, said the angry crowd, whose voices filled the arena loud. It's too bad he died that night. We just like to see a good fight. We just like to see some sweat. There ain't nothing wrong in that. It wasn't us that made him fall. You can't blame us at all. Who killed Davy Moore? Why? What's the reason? Not me, said his manager, puffing on a big cigar. It's hard to say, it's hard to tell. I always thought that he was well. It's too bad for his wife and kids, he's dead. But if he was sick, he should have said, It wasn't me that made him fall. You can't blame me at all. Who killed Davy Moore? Why? And what's the reason for? Not me, said the gambling man with his ticket stubs still in his hand. It 
It wasn't me that knocked him down My hands didn't touch him none I didn't commit no ugly sin Anyway, I put money on him to win It wasn't me that made him fall You can't blame me at all me, said the boxing writer, who pounds the print in his old typewriter, saying boxing ain't to blame, there's more danger in a football game, saying fist fighting is here to stay, it's just the American way, it wasn't me that made him fall, you can't blame me at all. Fists laid him low in a cloud of mist to come here from Cuba's door Where boxing ain't allowed no more I hit him, yes, yes, that's true But that's what I'm paid to do Don't say murder, don't say kill It was destiny, it was God's will Who killed baby more wine? What's the reason for? <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so who killed Davy Moore? Everybody? Now, it's not meant to be a, you know, a frustrating you know, philosophical exercise, but everybody kind of plays a role in an outcome. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I had a privilege to, to meet uh, Stanley a few times, but this is just after his wife died, and they really warned everybody, because he was broken. This, he said this is his last Comic-Con tour. Um, he's lived a very long life, has battled some health issues. But they said, whatever you do, do not you know, say how sorry you feel. He'll start crying, he'll leave, you know, just focus on what he's done for you, how he's made you feel, you know, say how much you love his work, right? All the characters he invented or enhanced over the years. So it's like, what do you say to Stan Lee when you got maybe a minute or two total while he's signing something, right? So I really agonized over it during the long line. And what I realized is, um, if you have a moment in your life, and I want you to think of your own moment, if you have a moment in your life where you did something selfless or something for other people, um, something that mattered, if you have a single heroic moment, you know, that's, that's a pretty good life. Um, over the last couple of years, we've encountered people like in hospitals and emergency surgeons and whatnot, or firefighters, emergency responders, 9-11 folks, um, and, and they're like, every day, all day, living a heroic life. And what I wanted to say to Stan Lee is, uh, I wanted to thank him for inspiring heroism, right? So he's not the one who did all those things, but think how many kids read a comic and wanted to do something bigger than themselves. And I really reflect on that a lot lately, because a lot of us do our jobs, and we're good at our jobs, and maybe we've been doing it in a while, maybe we got in for one reason, and maybe we stay in out of obligation, but when was the last time you did something that you really felt purpose? and that you felt intrinsically that you've made the world a little bit better. And I wanna ask you that question again towards the end of this talk, which is, what was your last moment of heroism or purpose or uh, service to others? And what are you gonna do next to maybe seek something that's more fulfilling and more satisfying, that makes you hate your job a little bit less? Apply your trade in an area that may be almost identical to your current profession, but maybe it's in a place that needs you more or will act on it more. And uh, we'll come back to that. Now, not everybody's motivated that way, so I'm gonna start with these five Ps. Um, we tend to use these when we talk to public policymakers because they like short lists. They like lists that all start with the same letter. So you're gonna see a lot of things like that. So we talk about, um, we had an argument with the FDA. They said, why the heck do researchers like Billy Rios even bother to, to find flaws in a medical device in the first place. That, that bedside infusion pump can get somebody killed. Why would you ever even look? You know, what's their motivation? So I just went up to the whiteboard and I drew these five Ps. Now this is not the comprehensive list, and I find that hackers are complicated. In fact, many of you are probably cringing at the term white hat, because we know there aren't any, but um, when we talk to these guys, I say, look, it's, there's, there's no single motivation for hackers. Um, there are protectors that want to make the world a safer place, right? If they don't tell you about this flaw they found, they're gonna lose sleep at night because they want to make sure no one gets hurt because of their action or inaction, right? There's puzzlers that do this for challenge and curiosity. That's why most of us got into this. Can I take the thing apart? Can I put it back together? Can I make it do something it wasn't supposed to do? Can I solve the Rubik's Cube? So a lot of us start as puzzlers, right? We do it for the challenge, right? The 
the defining characteristic of a hacker is curiosity. Some of them do it, and I'm sure you can think of the names of the ones that do, they do it for prestige, right? They wanna be the first to do something, or the best at doing it, or they wanna get the, you know, the, the TV spot or whatnot. And this is a different motivation, and it works, and some of the best work we've seen has been done out of uh, the desire to, to be the, the guy or the girl that does this thing. There's also profit and uh, professional development, right? personal gain. I want to do this because I want to make more money, get my own company, uh, grow my business, hire more folks. So that's not wrong either, right? But that drives some of us. And then there's, we, we quibble over this one, is it politics, protest, or even patriotism, but some sort of ideology within the bounds of the law. Like, why are you doing this? So the, maybe the, uh, the well-intentioned members of Anonymous saw themselves as being, you know, principled or, or, or whatnot in their choices in protest. So again, protectors, puzzlers, prestige, profit, and protests. I find that most of us major in one of these and minor in another. So for my part, I wanna be a protector. I wanna do things that matter and make people safer. But I also like it if it's really friggin' hard. So the puzzler part of me likes to tackle the hard problems. And I'm kinda asking you to answer for yourself, what, what's your motivation? Maybe you got in for one reason, but if you're at all a protector or you wanna be, then uh, I'd like to to pivot to the next part of this conversation. So um, <laughs> when we uh, launched certain initiatives that shall remain nameless, um, one of the things I said to folks is uh, people will have to die first before any real substantive action will take place. So after four years of doing that, almost exactly a year ago, tomorrow, um, a bunch of us went to Arizona and we did what any self-respecting hackers would do. We killed somebody, we killed three people actually. Uh, in an ER simulation, um, that's a dummy. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but what we had to do is create a visceral experience for healthcare professionals who had previously thought this was science fiction, movie plot, FUD, you know, that no one would ever hack a device, you couldn't do it, even if you did, we'd be fine. And we wanted to do what any good hackers do, and we wanted to uh, break assumptions. We wanted to challenge those assumptions and see what would happen. So we watched that video from Bob Dylan, right? Who killed Davy Moore? Um, and I had to have an, a, a very awkward conversation with Viss yesterday. Anybody follow Viss? Dan Teetler? Anyone not follow Viss? I think everyone's gonna follow Viss after this. Um, one of the things that Viss likes to do is Viss likes to go on Shodan. Anybody here not know Shodan? Okay. Uh, Viss likes to go on Shodan and find reckless and irresponsible connectivity either really old unpatched services or ports that shouldn't be exposed. And you know, Shodan, instead of looking for cat pictures or PDFs on the internet, looks for connected cyber physical systems. Yes, I said cyber, I'm gonna say it a lot because when you talk to Congress critters, you gotta use the word cyber. Um, so, but let's walk through this little story from yesterday because it's, uh, it's uh, all too scary, right? So it started with a vis, uh, Dan Teetler, that's his little avatar. Uh, this wanted to show us something, so he used Shodan to find uh, what reckless thing can I find today. We had a fight about this. Uh, then he wanted to show us how to get busy. Um, specifically, he, he turned his eyes to BusyBox. Everybody knows what BusyBox is? Pretty popular remote administration package. Um, and that's pretty harmless. You know, I cringe every time I see something from his Twitter feed. I'm like, what script kitty is gonna go play with this and get somebody hurt? Um, and it's just a matter of time, right? Like, why would you put a big blinking arrow kick me sign on something connected on Shodan that's vulnerable and exposed? But usually that's where all it goes. But does anybody know what the janitor, who the janitor was? I mean, here a bricker bot? So he retired after doing the bricker bot to clean up the Mirai botnet mess, right? The Mirai botnet was a whole bunch of internet connected uh, cameras with hard-coded credentials that the bot harvested. Uh, they were unpatchable devices, so internet connected, uh, hard-coded credentials, and unpatchable. Quite a little cocktail, allowed for the largest botnet at, at, in history at that point. And that botnet used 1 20th of its population to take out DynDNS and half the internet for a day in October a year ago. And uh, it, that 1 20th of the population only used 1 20th of its attack capacity. So a 20th of a 20th of a bunch of cheap IoT cameras um, did a lot of damage, scared a lot of people. 
So he wrote Rickerbot, the janitor, whoever he or she was, and uh, cleaned up the mess by physically destroying a bunch of these low-cost, low-hygiene devices. So it comes out of retirement and says, all right, I'm going to pick on Vis's Shodan search for BusyBox. And guess who else uses BusyBox besides a whole bunch of cheap IoT devices? I've seen it on t-shirts in the room. Uh, there's a ton of medical devices that use BusyBox. There's a lot of very expensive quarter million, half million dollar imaging systems that use BusyBox, and you can find them naked on the internet with certain search tools. There's a whole bunch of bedside infusion pumps that give you morphine or calcium blocker or some sort of drug drip using BusyBox connected to the internet. So that version of BrickerBot killed Davey Moore yesterday. Um, went in for a heart condition, got a calcium blocker drip, supposed to take three hours, emptied in 30 seconds. 30 seconds for three hours. So that excessive dose caused cardiac arrest and now Davey Moore is dead. Now of course this is a fictional uh, scenario, but it's all based in truth. Those BusyBox old versions are in fact A, in medical devices, B, in uh, network exposed cases for hospitals with no security staff, and C, um, discoverable on Shodan, and D, we've had uh, people like the janitor write Rickerbot to do mass cleanups of these low cost, low hygiene devices. So has this happened today or yesterday? Could it happen tomorrow or a week from now? Are there any technical barriers to this happening? It's an overzealous, overreaching, accidental compromise? Um, so it's a little bit of an experiment, but it, let me ask you in this particular case, and I'm gonna dwell on this for a couple of minutes here, who killed Davey Moore in this case? Who do you think the public will blame when they want a scapegoat? Who's gonna get screamed at when that bedside infusion pump kills Davey Moore? Anybody? So the first answer is this, I heard. So this will get blamed, all right? We have another answer, which is the hospital's fault. Maybe they should have gotten their SOS, their stuff off Shodan, right? Who else is this to blame? The manufacturer, I mean, it's, they're the ones who chose BusyBox, right? Maybe didn't patch it, keep it up to date. Who else is to blame? The regulators, why the regulators? Huh? Are there rules in place that regulators prevent you from patching? Is that your point? Okay. Uh, by the way, it's a, it's a lie and a myth that you're not allowed to patch FDA approved devices for security issues. Uh, people used to believe that, now they know better, and they still tell you a lie because they don't want to give you patches, or the hospitals lie because they don't want to apply the patches, but uh, it is not the case that you can't patch. What else? Anybody else going to get blamed? Right. Do we do we bear any responsibility? What about Shodan? Should Shodan be eliminated for making it so easy to find stuff? Okay. What about Rickerbot? Uh, janitor. The janitor caused the harm. He's the one that wrote the bot, right? I'm not sure who's going to be blamed in the court of law. I care more on a moral position here. Um, now, I'm going to share, I have to be very careful how I say this, I'm going to, my experience in ways that many of you won't really see is that after, for five years now, in, incredibly intensely trying to change public policy with regulators and, and Congress critters, um, there's a couple large software manufacturers that single-handedly block every single attempt to improve cyber hygiene or minimum hygiene standards for even safety critical stuff. So there's a couple uh, folks through the US Chamber of Commerce and some of the software trade associations that no matter how hard people work to try to make these things a little safer, a little better, um, they actively block that. And <laughs> talk to me tonight at the bar. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, there's some very aggressive uh, government affairs and lobbying going on to keep the status quo. But to quote Dr. Horrible, the status is not quo. <laughs> um, things are messed up, and they're getting worse. And one of the lines, the formative lines for the organization that shall remain nameless, is uh, our 
dependence on connected technologies growing faster than our ability to secure it. So think of every Christmas how many new IoT gadgets get added. Think every year how many new medical devices have hyper-connectivity, more functionality, more remote administration, more uh, predictive analytics and maintenance. Uh, think how many factories are getting connected to the web. Think how many uh, oil and gas refineries and pipelines. Um, so as we do that, um, it's increasingly necessary that our best and brightest from cybersecurity ranks help be that voice of reason and technical literacy, help be that helping hand and educator and ambassador and translator into FDA, into the Department of Transportation, into Congress, into the European Commission. And a lot of us turn our nose up, right? So I would argue that one of the ways we're to blame is we look at fire bad, right? Any policy, government's just gonna mess stuff up. And we think 100% of government involvement is a mistake. And a lot of it is a mistake. There was a terrible law introduced in Georgia right after they had the massive um, ransomware outage. It's terrible, horrible, terrible. Thank goodness the, the governor temporarily vetoed it. There's also some stuff happening that's really literate and really smart. And I have to get at least the people in this room and at this conference to start saying, let me hold my nose and eat my lima beans, right? Let me squeeze through my default nausea that some regulatory action might be bad. And let's me, let me be a helping hand to make sure it isn't bad. Because there's a, a growing number of folks like Jen Ellis and others that are doing quite a bit on the Hill to try to educate and make clueful things like decriminalize research, like raise minimum standards. And I'm gonna highlight a few of those. But I would say that part of our problem is we, uh, we turn our nose up or we wait for people to fail. And what I wanna ask you is if we're tipping on the edge of a knife where we might actually be that voice of reason that nudges these laws towards something intelligent, or if we're gonna sit back and watch it fail, um, we've got choices that each of us can make. You know, you don't even have to necessarily get in the arena, but we tend to snipe at each other for the folks that are trying. Uh, and our attitude in the middle is what's gonna tip things. All right, so let me jump to something that uh, Andrea Matwishin's law professor, she keeps saying, I'm tired of hearing for, uh, we're gonna have a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Hiroshima or a cyber Pearl Harbor, all of which are deeply offensive to anyone who uh, lost loved ones or grandparents or anything like that, terrible metaphors. And by the way, none of us should want that moment because every time we have one of those moments, we sacrifice liberties, we do something stupid, it gets codified for a very, very long time, and the downstream consequences of an emotional response are terrible. So she offered up that it's not gonna be like that. It's gonna be like this. Um, if you've seen me talk a lot, I love using this visual, but it, anybody know what this is that hasn't seen me before? Anybody know this picture? It is not the train full of oil at Dillard with Canada. Anybody else? One more guess? All right, this is a, uh, a river on fire. This is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. This is where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now stands in Cleveland. This river was so polluted from all the factories and the whaling on the riverbanks. It was so full of junk that it caught on fire. Now, how do you put out a body of water that's on fire? <laughs> I'm sure there's a way to do it, they did it. And, and, and one of the reasons I'm sure that <laughs> they did it is while this photo was snapped with the billowing black smoke uh, and it tipped public consciousness, this was not the first time it happened. Um, in fact, when she first told me, I thought she said it happened like three or four times. I went and did my history research. It happened 22 times across about 100 years, no, 70 years, about 70 years between the first fire and this. And maybe you'll say, well, but they could ignore it because it never did any damage. It actually burned bridges down, plural times. It burned factories along the riverbanks. So there was, there was harm, there were damages. Just nothing really said to them enough is enough until finally the right picture was taken at the right time. And this led to two things, the Clean Water Act and eventually the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. And some of the things they did in the emotional public outcry were pretty bad ideas that are still in the books. But it takes a series of fires to tip consciousness sometimes. So she says, we're not gonna have a Pearl Harbor, we're gonna have a cyber Cuyahoga. So, and I, I, I think she's right. And the good news about something like this is each new fire gives us a chance to maybe 
do more preparedness so we don't have an, an, a big overreaction. So you know these things, but when we talk to Congress critters and others and, the, and muggles and the, the general public, I say, look, the last two years we've had some fires. Like, people in our profession have known for 25 years you could hack power grids. Now we have proof the Ukraine uh, was attacked by Russia. We've known that you can use Shodan to find default passwords for internet connected dams and water treatment facilities. We now have the Department of Justice unsealing court cases that Iranian hackers successfully opened a slew in this dam in upstate New York. There was no water in it, and it at most would have flooded a golf course, but why the heck are Iranian hackers trying to open dams? We know that hospitals are wildly prone, and about two years ago, we had Hollywood Presbyterian shut down patient care for a week in LA. Now, they had to divert ambulances to other facilities. Can you imagine you have a, a, you're bleeding out in the back of an ambulance and you have to go blocks away in LA traffic to get care? Do you think time matters when you're bleeding in an ambulance? It's not even just that they had to divert ambulances in excess capacity, they actually had to move critical care patients because they could not administer health delivery services for a week. And if anybody uh, hears Jake or myself talk about software supply chain or open source software vulnerabilities or complain that CVE has huge blind spots for third party and open source libraries, that particular ransomware was a single Java deserialization flaw in a single JBoss library in a single medical technology. One single known vulnerability took out a whole hospital for a week. No one was trying to target hospitals. In fact, prior to this, there was really no targeting of the healthcare industry for ransomware. But when they accidentally landed in a hospital environment, the ransom crew said, oh wait, they have no security. Let's deliberately start targeting uh, hospitals. And now healthcare is the number one target of ransomware in the world. It went from nothing to the top target. So I saw Hollywood, Hollywood Presbyterian as my final enough is enough. And one of the reasons for that is uh, Jericho, Trisha.org, and I spent quite a bit of time researching the rise of hacktivism in Anonymous. We wrote a series called uh, Building a Better Anonymous, and we engaged the collective, and we pointed out there's very, 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 very few hackers in the, in the movement, and there are actually very, very, very few activists, too. Um, but one of the small hacking crews out of the UK was called Team Poison. This was their flag. One of the members of Team Poison uh, went to jail for hacking Tony Blair's website. His name was Trick, T-R-I, capital C, K. And uh, in our series, towards the end, I started getting dark and I started warning. I'm less concerned about Anonymous as they stand now. I'm more concerned about the blueprint that they represent because someone will adopt and perfect that blueprint. Well, I thought theoretically, eventually, maybe an extremist group would be inspired by uh, the blueprint of Anonymous. What I didn't realize is an actual hacker who went to jail for hacking uh, Tony Blair's website, not a very talented hacker. During his jail time, he radicalized, and this UK Birmingham uh, honor student named Trick, Junaid Hussein, uh, moved his punk rock Anglo-Saxon wife and child to Raqqa, Assyria, and he was the founder of the Cyber Caliphate. In fact, uh, Vince over there is in a documentary <laughs> on, uh, on this in, on CNN when they finally told uh, Trick's story. Um, it's way too scary and way too easy to see the rise of Trick. And out of seven billion humans, it doesn't matter what most of us would do. It matters what one of us would do. And while he focused most of his attention from Anonymous on recruiting and use of social media, and while the US intelligence community is mostly confounded at how we invented social media, but the cyber caliphate and ISIS was making much better use of it as an asymmetric information operations type thing, um, but if you watch this, and I highly encourage everyone to watch this, like, I thought we had every picture there was. She found some live video of him in a, in a rap video um, with dead eyes, and one of his best friends was that rapper, and they talked about what the heck happened to him, and could you talk him off the ledge, and it's just way too easy to make another trick. So Trick was killed by a drone strike. In fact, when he was killed, he was number four on the, the allied kill list. So I'm happy the trick is no longer on this planet. The sad news is, is several of his recruits have also had to be killed by drone strikes and they're not gone. In fact, uh, the, the UK intelligence guys said that they paid him dollar for dollar the same as they paid their battlefield soldier uh, leaders. So they prioritize his effectiveness at recruitment 
uh, as highly as they did the people who risked their lives. Now, he ended up taking a drone to the face, so he ultimately did pay with his life. But it's too easy to train and recruit someone to get a, a laptop, use Shodan, find something with hard-coded passwords. Hacking isn't even required. Just log in and have the willpower to do this. So we've always had an attack surface, but that attack surface is growing. We've always had the means, and the barriers to entry for those means are dropping. But what Trick represented to me is someone with the motive to take life in cyberspace. So when I saw Hollywood Presbyterian, I said, if an accident can take out a single hospital, what could Trick do? And that's when uh, a couple of us quit our jobs and went into the public uh, policy think tank for a two-year surge to try to push much harder, much faster on being more resilient for such an inevitability. Because I asked, I said, are there any technical barriers to a sustained denial of patient care on any or all hospitals in LA or in the country? And on the healthcare task force we formed, that was the very first meeting, and no one in the room could come up with a single technical barrier. I said, so our mission is not to make HIPAA suck slightly less. Our mission is to recognize that we have more incentive to have a corpse with their privacy intact than we do to protect patients and patient care. So we're gonna focus on where bits and bites meet flesh and blood. And that's what we did for a year and a half. Now, our concern wasn't that this would happen. In fact, in a couple slides, you're gonna see it got worse since Hollywood Presbyterian. But it was more, I'm less concerned about Davy Moore's death, the first death, or more concern, less concerned about even several deaths in the first attack, because people die all the time in hospitals. Let's be adults about this. I'm more concerned that a crisis of confidence in the public will cause a retreat from otherwise superior connected technologies. These new medical breakthroughs are awesome. Self-driving cars are gonna save so many more lives. Humans are terrible drivers. I got in a fight with the, the administrator of uh, Department of Transportation, NHTSA, they call it National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. He yelled at Charlie Miller and myself and a couple other car hacker type folks saying, you guys are scaring people away from self-driving cars. I'm all in. He's like, we lose 370,000 US citizens a, uh, a year. I, I, no, 37,000, I think, is the number or something like that. And we did the math. It's basically 100 a day. So while I've been talking, we've had several friends or loved ones in the country die. And 96% of them are human error and human choice. So he said, so I'm not going to delay that by one day the idea of getting you know, drunk, distracted, inexperienced drivers off the road. And he pounded his hand on the desk, and he was absolutely right. Humans are terrible drivers. I said, sir, that's exactly why I want to engage you, because if we're cavalier about the peril, right, there's a promise and a peril. If we're cavalier about the peril, a crisis of confidence from a few deaths will postpone your dream by three to five years, easy. And then he changed his body posture, and then we started talking. But it's not so much that people are going to die. Of course they are, right? And it, on the whole, most of these innovations are going to make the world a better place. They're going to make the world a safer place. But they have to do it unconscientiously, and I think that's the role for this room. And if we're not playing that role, we're almost complicit in the death of Davy Moore. So we tried to push real hard in that surge. We have had several um, small victories and large. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. It's actually a longer list since I made this slide. But we, got, uh, we, we were targeting three first-of-a-kind U.S. policies. We wanted to help the FDA fix their cyber, uh, what would they call it, post-market guidance for connected medical devices. And what that said is, how will we do, decide whether or not to do a recall for a purely cybersecurity-related issue? We knew about NTIA, which is part of the Commerce Department. They were doing a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program to develop best practices for inviting researchers acting in good faith and not suing them. So that was kind of in our interests. And we knew that if we pushed really, really hard, maybe we can get the automotive uh, regulators at NHTSA to maybe do something as well. So we targeted three. Now the timing and the instinct was right, though, because the appetite was huge. And in fact, we got 18 through. Now this does not mean we can declare victory. There's no you know, victory banner behind me here. And there's a lot more to do. And a lot of these are really, really cursory things, like the medical devices must be patchable really simple things like you need tamper evident forensically sound evidence capture or logging on these things. So there's by no means are we going to have this stuff solved, but this is how we had to start from total ignorance to you know crawl then walk then run. 
Now, one of the methods um, pushed by this um, coalition of the willing and the group that shall remain nameless was called the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices. And one of the things we've learned is the only, one of the best ways to affect change is to use the language of the targets that you're speaking with. So doctors and nurses already care about patient safety. They already take a symbolic oath. It's part of their profession. So we wrapped you know, cybersecurity goals and said, you must be this tall to ride the internet of medical devices. And it says, if all systems fail, you have to be able to avoid failure, take help avoiding failure, capture, study, and learn from failure, contain and isolate failure, and inoculate against future failure. We got a big framework. We talked them through it. We got them to realize, oh, wow, yeah. If this thing gets hacked and we can't patch it, what, what are our options? And as such, um, you know, the FDA has probably been the best one at this. They, they put in their post-market guidance, for example, a very clever hack. They said, if you have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, inviting researchers acting in good faith to report issues to you without fear of lawsuit, and you can mitigate the issue they report in 30 days and fix it in 60 days, then you don't have to get a recall. So they didn't say you have to have a coordinated disclosure program and you have to work with hackers, but you they basically said you're an idiot not to. And a lot of device makers said, we can't do that. It takes us you know, 180 days to do our QA cycle. We can't possibly do this. And she said, fine, then don't. I'll just give you a recall. So if you have a vulnerability, an unmitigated pathway to harm was the phrase, I'll give you a recall. And you know what they all did? They all went back and they said, how much can we compress our QA cycle? And one of them got it down to 45 days. And then they came back later and they got it down to 15 days. So without that impetus and that pressure to say that the mean time to exploitation is now measured in days or, or weeks, but the mean time to resolution is measured in months or years, we're screwed. And FDA really stood up to that test and they did some very controversial things. And now we went from two medical device makers having courting disclosure programs to I think the last time I checked our site, I think we've got 18. And that's not enough. There's hundreds of device makers, but it is now becoming odd not to have a disclosure program to work with hackers like the folks in this room. Um, we also had to communicate to ourselves because a lot of hackers are like, oh, I'm going to give them 60 days, like the Google Project Zero. I'm like, do you know how things work in safety critical, highly regulated environments? 60 days is not going to help. Like, they're, you're going to, you know, this is going to be disruptive. So we tried to create some empathy in the other direction. I said, guys, I know we don't think it's a beautiful, unique snowflake, but IoT is different. It's different in material ways, at least for them. And one of those things is um, there's different adversaries, like Trick. There's different, these aren't script kitties or people that are going to be economically motivated. They may be nation states, like Russia attacking Ukraine with not Petya and accidentally taking out Merck, doing 300 millions of damage uh, and interrupting the, the production of vaccines for a national security supply of vaccines. So different adversaries, different consequences of failure. So it might be that an availability attack is a nuisance for us in the enterprise, but it might be a loss of life or an explosion on a gas and pipeline if it can't get command instructions to relieve pressure. In different context, you can't do multi-layer defense on an insulin pump. It's a migratory device. It's a tiny one, which leads into the next one. It's a different composition of goods. It's a different firmware, hardware, firmware, software stack. You can't depend on a desktop EDR that's going to run on your OS for your uh, insulin pump. You can't depend on a, a network IDS when this device is following you around. There's different economics. Some of these things have razor thin margins. There is no money to hire a single security person, let alone a security team, and have an SDL. And uh, there's no investment community like VCs to, to, to do this. There's no one to buy the security for a lot of these things, so no one's ever going to create any. And then lastly, massively different time scales. It takes seven years from when I decide to make a medical device to get it designed, implemented through clinical trials and approved. About seven years. And they're deployed for about 15, so do the math. And what's the average time to live for a Windows embedded operating system? Am I ever gonna have a device? We, we, we keep scratching our heads saying, why is there Windows XP in these medical devices? That's actually, in some ways pretty modern compared to the time to live for R&D and deployment. So that's why it's often a best case scenario to see Windows XP in a clinical environment. So when you look at these different adversaries, different consequences, different composi context, composition of goods, economics, and time scales, you know, we have to be more conscientious as well as we engage these folks. Now, I don't want to admire the problem and accept their status quo, and that's why we pushed on folks like FDA to try to compress those uh, 
patch expectations, and through that necessity, people figured out a way to do it. We actually have a medical device maker who's doing DevOps, like actual DevOps, CI, CD pipelines for FDA approved medical devices, because they concluded the only way to consistently meet that 30 day, 60 day window was to radically change their software development process and automated unit testing. Now, it wasn't those uh, proactive efforts that actually finally got through to Congress folk, it was Mirai. It was the tsunami of attacks from that Mirai botnet. And part of it was the Bricker bot that scared us because when the janitor uh, went around and started destroying some of these devices, I went to Suzanne Schwartz at the FDA and I said, you know what else has an internet connection, fixed credentials, and are unpatchable? Most legacy medical technology. And she's like, Oh boy. So what I was concerned about is what if the next MRI was composed of MRI machines and bedside infusion pumps? And or what if the next target for denial of service is something much like Sam Sam hit? So let me jump to the really uncomfortable stuff in the healthcare task force report. So there was a trinity of very problematic things in a four week span. We were just about to publish this thing. It was actually supposed to be May of 2017. But on Mother's Day weekend, almost exactly a year ago, the, well, well, we'll get to that in a second. So this healthcare industry task force report, we had to get consensus across 21 people. Some of them were surgeons or chief medical officers. Some were medical device makers, large and small. We had a pretty wide swath of, uh, of um, professionals involved in this thing. And some of them were incredibly risk averse and didn't want to say anything that could look bad on their industry. But they all unanimously agreed to this graphic. And if you can't read, I'm gonna summarize this for you. Healthcare cybersecurity is in critical condition. Unequivocal statement. And the top five uncomfortable truths we chose to put in here out of the 20 something that we had flagged are that there's a severe lack of security talent. Our estimate is that 85% of the health delivery organizations, HDOs, 85% lack a single security person. Not one. Now I don't know about the facility next door, but the, what we found is the large ones have teams, they're not big teams, but the small, medium, and rural have nobody. And we said, well, wait a second, what about HIPAA? And they said, yeah, they require you have a designated ISO, or information security officer. But what we found is it's usually a nurse. And I'm not belittling nurses, they, they're doing their best. But they, the one that was considered the best in the country at being an ISO as a nurse, she said, can you guys give us a CISSP crash course boot camp for three, for three days? I said, no, I don't think we can. And she's basically just self-taught the best she could, but the overwhelming majority of our health delivery organizations have zero security people on staff. There is no one to take the InfraGuard notice that a new ransomware is coming. There's no one to apply patches. The segmentation isolation that we would normally do doesn't happen. So number one, 85% lack a single person, and we have no idea how to solve that, by the way. Number two, legacy equipment. So this is why our Windows XP is often a best case. They're starting to get to Windows 7 in some cases. A lot of them are giving up on Windows and going to Android. Not necessarily better. The third one is that HIPAA broke everything. Uh, the High Tech Act, the race to have connected medical devices, um, was basically the push for electronic health records. So what they did is they did not design or architect brand new devices. They took existing devices and they slapped in a connection on it. Uh, and they did it in a very brittle way that's usually very in poor on interoperability. And what this did is it took devices that were never meant to be connected to anything and it forced them to connect to everything and it tied reimbursement to it. So you couldn't actually get reimbursed for technologies that couldn't do this. So we weaponized in our, our weakness. And this led to overconnectivity to each other and often a blast radius that a single device can actually take out the whole hospital. And given no perimeter gateway type solutions because there's no security people, they're quite prone. Which is number four, that this isn't about HIPAA, this is that we have seen vulnerabilities take out patient care. It's that cascading failure where the blast radius is the whole facility. And lastly, um, Billy Rios and some others uh, took a couple medical devices. One in particular had 1,400 CVEs in it. I'm gonna say that again, 1,400. Now that was a particularly egregious one. Um, what? The average, uh, it was not uncommon to see over 1,000. Think about it, really old OS, people believe you're not allowed to patch, manufacturers tend not to patch. So the situation's messed up. I'm gonna stitch that together for you. 85% of our hospitals lack a single security person like you working for them. We have more janitors than we have security people. 
And there's reasons that janitors are important in hospitals. And there's increasingly reasons that cyber hygiene is as important as sterile equipment. Number two, we're running really old, hard to defend stuff even if we had a security team that's overconnected to itself and the outside world. A single flaw in a single device has proven to take out patient care and the average device can give us a thousand chances to do so. I would say the situation's kind of messed up. And this is the unanimous posture to Congress on that task force. So I got in a fight with a medical professional in our industry who said, stop blaming us, it's not our fault. He goes, we can't afford it. And just flippantly, I didn't mean to be flippant, I said, well, if you can't afford to protect it, then you can't afford to connect it, right? And it wasn't to judge him at all, even though that's how it was taken. It was to say, look, I might want to drive a tractor trailer truck, but I can't, I'm not allowed. It's an awesome responsibility with driving something that big. So I have to go get tested. I have to prove I can do that. I might want to drive a, 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 a naval vessel. I can't. I have to prove I can be a captain. So the question started becoming, what's the level of commensurate connectivity? So I went, went back to my Stan Lee-isms, and I said, okay, let's do this one instead. <laughs> and no one got mad about this one. But as we were about to publish this report, and I'm going to go a lot faster now, um, this happened. So Mother's Day weekend, um, pretty terribly written, pretty cruddy, not very impressive piece of ransomware that was wormable. It took advantage of the eternal blue flaw um, for open uh, SMB. And um, while not targeting healthcare, the industry hit hardest was healthcare. 81 hospitals in the UK in four hours. 81 hospitals gone, unable to deliver patient care, including stroke and trauma centers. And if you know anyone who's had a stroke, um, you have about three hours uh, before uh, permanent damage or death. So time matters for strokes, and most of their stroke trauma centers were completely offline. So to just do a little math, um, that's about 41% of the national capacity of the UK. So for a weekend, over Mother's Day weekend, lots of people died, lots of extra people died. Now, how do we know that? Now, we don't know Davy Moore died. We can't point to which person would have or lived otherwise. But there was a study in Boston Marathon. They eventually showed all four different marathon cities. Seminal piece of work in the New England Journal of Medicine that had nothing to do with hacking. It said, if you have a heart attack on the day of the Boston Marathon, you have a statistically more likely chance of dying than if you had a heart attack any other day. Well, why is that? It's that the ambulance route was 4.4 minutes longer on average. So they did this in Chicago, in LA, in New York, and across the board, you had a statistically higher, I think 7% chance, higher chance of fatality after a 30, 60 day window. So the, the this abstraction from this report that has nothing to do with cyber is that for heart, lungs, and brain, uh, any delayed or degraded patient care absolutely affects mortality rates. So more delays, more deaths. So how many delays do you think were incurred for a whole weekend of outages for 41% of the UK's capacity? So they've been very forthcoming and candid about their analysis and publishing a lot of their findings. But you know we have skill sets that can help take a bite out of how often we suffer those outages and how painful they are when we do and how prompt and agile our response can be when they do. And then the third leg of this stool was um, we did this thing called the CyberMed Summit. We had met two hackers, um, two physicians at DEF CON in the green room on our first birthday. And I'm like, you guys are wearing like scrubs. Are, what, are you pretending to be doctors? They're like, oh, no, no, we're med students. I'm like, and you're hackers too? And like, yep. I'm like, that's so cool. We got to do something together. It took a long time. But basically they said, you know, you guys got to stop talking about hacking pacemakers. Like if you hack a pacemaker for 96% of their patients, they're just going to get tired. Like, very few people actually need every beat of their heart. Now we have a friend, Marie Mo, who does need every beat of her heart, and she hacks her own pacemakers now, and she's amazing. But in general, they said, you guys, you know hacking, but you don't know medicine. So if you really want to compel action, let's connect real human physiology with real hacking. And that's what we did, it took a while. Um, so we brought together lots of government stakeholders. We did a two-day workshop. We killed three people in ER simulations. Uh, they took a page from the FAA where they, for flight training, and they basically say, you're going to see these weird things once in a while in hospitals, uh, like a pregnant woman who needs a defibrillator. There's two heartbeats. What do you do? Well, you'll see it once or twice a year, so you better train for it. So it's not going to be obvious what to do. You're going to have to have muscle memory to know how to do it. So they train, and they train with actors, 
and with surgical dummies that are incredibly expensive and lifelike, and they bleed and they cut and they have ribs that crack and they have organs to take out. So we wrote three scenarios, and I don't have time to get into them right now, um, but basically um, one was a hacked infusion pump, um, bedside infusion pump, that's the one that scares me the most. One was a, uh, a pacemaker defibrillator, which we used to give an electroshock to the patient once a minute on the minute, like a Russian roulette, and cause cardiac arrest. I have a video of that that I'm not gonna play. And um, one was a hacked insulin pump like J. Radcliffe's or the one Barnaby Jack did. All three patients died. We were told, don't worry, we'll just treat the symptoms. All three patients coded at least once. Um, we did give them nudges in coaching to help them do it. Uh, none of them at any point suspected that the devices were compromised. All of the hacks were real demonstrable hacks for real device manufacturers. Um, and they scripted this so that any hospital in the country or in the world now can just take their script for these ER sims and do it whether they know anything about hacking or not. They know the inputs and the outputs and they can do it. Uh, we had um, ABC Nightline did a fairly tasteful nine minute piece on it. That's a long piece for journalism. Um, they tried to approach it quite responsibly. You guys might be crying FUD, but it's just because it's scary doesn't mean it isn't true. And we tried to make sure this is really well tempered and well balanced with people like Marie Mo and, and real physicians. Um, I, if he'll let me, I'll, I'll let you hear one scream from our. our uh, but yeah, hopefully you can slow down. Everyone knows what's going on except the guy in the white coat. We have a 74 year old male with chest pain. History of heart. I don't see how to talk about that. Yes, 15, blood pressure 150 over 75, heart rate 20, respiratory rate 20. We'll be there in. Come on. All right, I'm not going Yes, we copy. All right, I'll give you 30 there. seconds. Right. We got the first screen. So, what's going on? Uh, this is a 74 year old male. He uh, started having chest pain approximately 30 minutes ago. His mom is rushing to watch the TV. He does have a history of two MIs. He also has a third degree heart block, which he had a placemaker case. I'm going to lay you down so we can move you over. Okay, and we got the setup. All right, you're not going to hear the scream today. Um, look, we wrote the thing. We knew what was going to happen, and it still screwed us up. Um, but we will make all those videos available. The second thing we did, though, in some ways was scarier, but no one put it in the, the TV show. We did a tabletop where we said, we're going to do a ransomware event on this hospital we're all in with the state and local authorities. And then we're going to do round two. We're going to take out all the hospitals in the city because you're all using the same stuff. So why do you think you're going to be lucky enough to divert ambulances? And then the third round, we were going to add a physical attack, like a bombing, like a Boston Marathon bombing to the Arizona Diamondback Stadium. We knew they would flip to what's called a mass casualty event, where they only save the savable. You just write people off. We just didn't know when. Um, turns out they flipped to a mass casualty event in the first 10 minutes. Let me tell you why. This is why fire drills are important. All we did was log into the building automation software with the default passwords that you can Google. We didn't actually hack, we just logged in. And we said, pay us this much Bitcoin or you can't use your buildings. And two things happen. One, no elevators means no surgeries, it turns out. You gotta get people to the surgical floors. No elevators, no surgeries. So anyone who needed surgeries was shipped up the street or out of luck. Number two, it was Arizona, 116 degrees, and the buildings are 100% glass, they're ovens. So no AC, I think they said they knew exactly how many minutes before it was inhospitable for humans. So they had to evacuate the hospital. I'm like, whoa. So then we said, well, at least we can have the National Guard set up a facility in a nearby gymnasium. And they said, actually, no, because you also took out our electronic health record system with a default password which we did, and the, the chief medical officer says, we got this, we'll just use paper copies, which is, by the way, what they tell Congress every single time they're asked, are you prepared for a disaster? They say, yeah, we'll just use paper records. So his lieutenant leans over and says, uh, sir, we can't do that. And he says, why not? We've been doing, I've been doing medicine for you know, X, X years, and he said, you told us to stop teaching medical students that seven years ago. None of our staff has ever seen one. So they had paper printouts, but they don't know how to read them, and they certainly don't know how to write orders. So then he turned white. So between the building automation passwords, nothing but default passwords, we flipped to a mass casualty event for the city in round one. The rest was just insult to injury. 
Now, I'm going to very briefly give you some lima beans. I'm not advocating for this bill. In fact, I think Senator Warner spoke to you guys. I'm just telling you it exists because I had an argument with several of you. And I normally do this one-on-one -on -one Socratically. Someone said, oh, that stupid IoT bill. It's so dumb. It's not going to fix anything. So this was a response to the Mirai botnet. Remember what I told you happened with the Mirai botnet? It was low-cost, low-hygiene IoT that had an internet connection, a fixed password, and was unpatchable. So I said, fine, if you think the bill's stupid, what would you do? What would you like to see if you could write a piece of legislation to make low-cost IoT safer, to not make another Mirai botnet? And there's lots of stuff you could do. You could do carriers and stuff, and you can you network, and you could have record bots and whatnot. So maybe things should be patchable. Would you live with that one? It's like, okay, yeah, I could see that if the government wants to buy stuff, they should buy patchable stuff, all right? Well, what if we forbid hard-coded passwords? Would that be reasonable? And most people will say, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to have fixed passwords you can't change if you want to. I'm like, okay, should you be able to sell something that has, you know, 100 known vulnerabilities from 10 years ago? Well, no, it should probably be, you know, healthy when you sell it. I'm like, okay, we'll figure out what that means. What about hackers? Should, what, could we crowdsource and find a lot of bugs in these things so that they're found by good guys before they're found by bad guys, you know? Oh, yeah, well, that would be cool. So what if we required they all had coordinated disclosure programs before you could sell to the government? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, hacker rights, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, a lot of these guys, they don't have a big staff. They're probably going to try to roll their own crypto if they have crypto at all. It's like, oh, no, they should absolutely use, you know, industry standard crypto. I'm like, okay. I'm like, that's the bill. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's perfect. There's some big problems in it. But, like, you had a senator basically say, I don't want anything sold on taxpayer money to the federal government that doesn't have a coordinated disclosure program. And Katie's going to talk tomorrow. I mean, when you have senators pushing the embrace of coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs, that's, that's, that should be something we like. And yet, how many people told me this bill's you know, stupid? Um, and if you really want some hilarious stuff, listen to the guy on the end from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Matt Eggers. Um, he gets cornered by Will Hurd of Texas, who came to DEF CON last year, by the way, just prior to this um, testimony. And he said, so, Mr. Eggers, you're saying that these provisions in this bill would, would be burdensome and would be brittle and would be stale before the ink was dried on the legislation. So my question to you is, take all the time you want. Can you name a single use case for any of your constituents, past, present, or future, where it's acceptable to sell the U.S. government a product with a password of password that I can't change? Take all the time you want. you got to listen to his answer. So, um, there are strong forces pushing back on things like making devices patchable or trying to discourage um, hard-coded passwords. And if we can't win on something like hard-coded passwords, we're going to suffer a lot of low hygiene IoT for a long, long time. And it's one thing when it's internet cameras, it's another entirely when it's the medical devices we depend upon for our families. So the only victory I'm going to end on is um, some of us have been pushing this notion of third-party open source supply chain hygiene, cyber supply chain hygiene. And it's been vociferously fought off by one particularly large software company. A lot of the other ones are coming around. But we, I would say collectively we've had a huge victory. So one of the task force recommendations was that all medical devices should have a software bill of materials of the third-party and open source libraries used and their version numbers. And the point of this is when you buy new medical equipment, we want you to know how many known vulnerabilities are in it. So you can tell product A from B from C who does terrible hygiene and who does great hygiene. But the real use case is during the operational lifespan in the clinical environment, if there's another attack, you should be able to answer, am I affected and where am I affected in seconds? And right now, even though Hollywood Presbyterian was warned about the Sam Sam ransomware, they had no idea if any other devices used that version of JBoss or what the heck a JBoss was. So the idea of an ingredients list, just like we have on food for allergies and health reasons, um, the, the victory is that the congressional oversight for healthcare said, we love this recommendation. HHS, go do it. So we're not going to get this on all IoT, but the belief is one year into this not doing all the things that these large software makers claim are going to happen, the, a year into this proving it's a valuable and necessary uh, institution and market signal, then maybe we'll go widescreen. So, and I have, to my delight, can add to that that yesterday the NTIA or the U.S. Commerce Department announced a multi 
uh, stakeholder working group on the creation of software bill of materials and software supply chain transparency. And if you care at all about that stuff, please get engaged and involved. So with that, I'm gonna skip to the end. And thank you for your time. But here's the parting thought. It hasn't happened yet. We haven't had that point where we all regret our decisions. We haven't wondered what our role is and who killed Davy Moore. But if we keep depending on this undependable stuff, it's not an if, it's a when. And it's not FUD, it's a fact. And that scenario I painted where VIS does a tweet from a showdown vulnerability on something like BusyBox, that is not, it might be <laughs> creative fiction, but it's not science fiction. So we've had several fires. We're probably gonna have a few more before things tip, but I wanna know what role each of you are gonna play. So, if you're feeling heroic, if you're wondering what you should do next, I can think of a few hospitals that might need your help. All right, thank you. <laughs>